I kept staring at the slowly ticking clock. Based solely on my biological assessment of time, it felt like days had passed, but according to the clock itself, it had been no more than a measly half hour. It was the same with the big clock on each train. It simply didn't work together with reality. Measuring each minute, it was a small eternity. With John dead, we felt more vulnerable than ever. And since his death, we hadn't spoken a word. I know we're all on edge, but I think it's uh, time we discuss what we're going to do once the train stops again, Frank said in his usual annoying tone. Both Mia and I knew our true destination, but hadn't told Frank. Last time had come, and if we stood even the faintest chance of surviving, we had to be able to rely on each other. Frank, we need to tell you something, I said. His eyes narrowed in suspicion at my obviously guilty tone. Tell me what? Our destination. Jania. Well, I trailed off. Yeah, what about it? It's... Um... Jania's hell, Frank. We're all going to hell. Mia burst out, annoyed by my hesitation. We fell silent for a few seconds while Frank processed what he just told him. Then he suddenly burst out laughing. Really? Hell, that's the best you could do, he said. I just nodded in response. So you mean to tell me that we're all already dead? That our next stop will be the realm of Satan himself? Yeah, I guess. Why is that funny? Well, if you haven't noticed already, two of us died. How is that possible if we're already dead? Where's John and Philip, huh? He had a point. Our conventional idea of hell required us to be dead already, though it never stated whether you died twice or what happens upon second death. We're clearly not dead, but that doesn't mean we're not going to a horrific place. Regardless of what you might think, Jenea means hell, Mia said. The argument went on fruitlessly for a while, Frank never giving in and admitting that we weren't going to reach salvation once the train stopped. In the meanwhile, I kept staring out the window, the once green fields of killer crystals have long since vanished. The forest of red pillars had grown so dense that it finally blocked out each ray of light brave enough to attempt an illumination of our path. If I hadn't known better, I could have thought that we were back in the void. But it felt different. Far hotter than it had before. Even more devoid of hope. Before I got a chance to question the environment, the darkness gave way to a large open space. Devoid of any life, just a rocky, flat surface surrounded by infinitely tall cliffs on each side. It was a valley... Gray and dull, with little to no light penetrating a layer of thick clouds above. Then the train started to slow down. We're coming to a stop, Mia said as she peeked out through the window. The tracks end here. Before long, the train stood still and all the doors opened automatically, signaling for us to get off. There was a sign on the empty platform next to us written in a language I couldn't comprehend. I pulled out my crumpled up ticket and compared the text, noticing that some of it matched. Jenea, I mumbled. So what now? We get off the train, wander the wasteland? Or sit here with the last of our supplies waiting for hunger to kill us? Frank asked. We never got the chance to make a decision before the train simply started disintegrating around our feet. First the windows turned to sand, then the seats rotted away as if hit with a thousand years of time. And finally, the floor started to crack, causing us to plummet into the ground. I groaned in pain as I landed, severely twisting my ankle, while the others landed slightly more elegantly. Mia and Frank helped me to my feet as we witnessed the last chunks of trains just vanish before our eyes. We climbed off the tracks and onto the platform. We were situated on a bridge, giving us a clear view of our surroundings. It was a city, at least a 
used to be one. Now nothing more than the ruins of a previously inhabitable place. Tall cliffs stood around the city too steep to be climbed, too massive to allow for much light. We were in the shadows, clueless and lost. I looked around at the worn down buildings, desperately searching for any kind of life, but there was none to be found. Without any other options, we headed down to the streets and started searching for a way out. The houses were mostly empty, too broken to set foot in without risking total collapse, filled only with crumpled papers written in a language none of us could understand. Where they had furniture, it was crudely constructed from debris of metal. It could only be bone fragments. Whoever built any of it, they were nowhere to be seen. How much food and water do we have left? Frank asked. Enough for maybe a day? Mia responded. He sighed in response. We kept walking. I limped behind the other two and my twisted ankle until we eventually reached a large open square, surrounded with what looked like temples. Unlike the surrounding buildings, they were beautifully built, in stark contrast to their surroundings. In the middle of the square sat an emaciated figure, a man with white, thin hair and protruding prominent limbs from a starving body. He didn't seem to notice us as we quickly approached him to see if he needed any help, but even as we spoke to him, he just sat there, rocking back and forth, as he mumbled over and over again in a hoarse, sickly voice. I just want to die. Why won't you let me die? I just want to die. Why not? Why? 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 Mia bent down in front of him and tried to get his attention. His eyes had turned white from cataract, rendering him completely blind, and chunks of flesh were missing from his chest and abdomen, visibly infected and smelling like rot. She reached out and checked his pulse, quickly retreating her hand. He's dead. What do you mean, dead? He's clearly living, talking, and everything, Frank said. Look at him. No one could have survived those wounds, and he doesn't have a pulse. Of course she was right. I mean, the man should have been dead, yet there, there he sat, crying in agony, begging for a death that never came, suffering blind and deaf without anything to connect him to the world that he lived in. What do we do? I asked. I think maybe we just, we just finish him off, Frank said meekly. We can't. He's... Let me have stopped mid-sentence, realizing that for once, Frank... Frank was right. I'm sorry, I think... I think I've got to agree with Frank on this one. He wants to die. The least we can do is to... to free him, I said, as kindly as I could. Frank pulled John's knife out of his backpack and looked at us for the go-ahead. I, I nodded in return. You, you guys better look away, Frank said. He bent down behind the suffering man and whispered that he was, he was sorry, before quickly slitting the man's throat. To all of our surprises, not a drop of blood poured out from the newly formed wound. Instead, the man just fell to the ground and gargled incomprehensibly. A whole minute passed, and then another. Yet the man refused to die. The city wouldn't let him, and rather than freeing him, we just put him into a whole other level of misery, taking away his voice and his ability to beg for death. I... Uh, I, I didn't... Frank stuttered as he realized what he'd done. With that, as if a veil had been lifted from our blind eyes, we finally saw the empty city for what it truly was. Rather than the desolate ruins that we'd met as we entered, we saw a fully populated city. Filled to the brim with suffering inhabitants, each mutilated in various degrees. Most of them were blind with their eyes either ripped out or, or turned to coal, and those unfortunate enough to see had their limbs removed or their organs torn out into the street, unable to do anything to end their miserable existence. As the horrific realization hit us, the ground below us started to move. The city had finally noticed our unwelcome presence, and it reacted violently by pulling itself apart, creating a gaping chasm in the middle of the square that swallowed anyone unlucky enough to be in the way. What's happening? Frank asked in panic. I, I don't know, but 
Then let's get out of here, I yelled in response. The chasm quickly widened, revealing a massive hole extending down into a dark abyss with spikes and black tendrils extending from the burning walls beneath us. With my sprained ankle, I couldn't keep up with the others and spilled to the ground as it shook violently. Thomas! Mia yelled as she rushed to my aid, Frank continuing to flee towards the alleys. She pulled me up just in time to avoid being swallowed by the ground. We headed after Frank, who had started running down one of the alleys, seemingly devoid of any people. As we entered the alley, the concrete walls started moving vigorously. Frank, wait! I yelled, but he didn't hear me. By the time he noticed the walls, it was already too late, and the hundreds of spikes shot out from the walls, morphing out from the concrete. Frank dodged the first one as he tried to retreat back towards us, and for a moment it seemed like he was in the clear before one final spike emerged and penetrated straight through Frank's abdomen. With the mortal wound, the wall fell silent. Frank collapsed to the ground, holding onto his guts, unable to scream from the intense pain. Frank! We yelled simultaneously as he rushed to his mangled body. He lay there in shock, his eyes darting frantically back and forth between us, too wounded to move. He didn't even realize the severity of his injury. Mia tried her best to stop the bleeding by applying pressure, but it, but it hardly slowed down the incessant flow of crimson blood. Okay, I I'm okay. I'm okay. I I'll be alright, Frank kept repeating in panic, getting quieter with each iteration. I'm okay. I'm okay. He quickly bled out, too fast to accept his ultimate demise. And all we could do was sit over him as... as he let out a final breath. He fell silent. The ground started moving again, not to... not to attach us, but to swallow Frank. To fuse his limp body with the concrete beneath him. Within seconds, he'd vanished and became one with the city of Jenea. Before we could get the chance to catch our breaths, the wall started moving again. With my injured leg, I knew that I stood no chance to escape, and Mia didn't have to die with me. Mia, get out of here, I yelled, as spikes formed around us, reaching out to destroy our vulnerable bodies. Out of nowhere, a dark rumble sounded alongside a bright light, and the ground came to a standstill. An old man emerged from the alley, wearing a worn-out but perfectly tailored suit, and a cane in his left hand. The sound shook us and I grabbed my ear, futilely trying to block out, but it barely helped. The hell are you kids doing here? The man said. As both Mia and I passed out. Hey there, kids. Thank you for listening to tonight's episode of the Creepypasta Storytime podcast, or... If you're watching on YouTube, thank you for subscribing to the YouTube channel. If you're not on YouTube, then thank you for listening on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts and following there. If you guys are Reddit users, like I'm sure many of you are, if you're following those no sleep authors that are super cool. Uh, one other Reddit community you can always check out or be active in or talk about or post memes in is the Mr. Creepypasta Reddit. It's just r slash Mr. Creepypasta. You can always find the channel icon there. And also I'll pop in every now and again and post random things because I can. And now for patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta, which you can always find in the link in the description, I want to give you all a very big thanks. There's many of you down there in the descriptions um, who I give Big thanks to, and everybody also at this tier, like Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Chompinski, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, A.G. Weevil 3, Diana Kraus, Stephen Van Hus, Tristan Pelton, Nico Kao, The Ginger Bros, Dante Rao, Rafael Rodriguez, Last Blade Song, Don Mulemeister, Eliminator 86, Nebsky, Steampunk Sinner, Optimistic Avocado, Caleb Dougal, Daniel Polson, Finley, and Sky Harbor. You guys are the MVPs and you guys keep the channel running and I honestly cannot thank you enough for all that you do. That's all for tonight guys. Sweet dreams.